Rachel Lung? Yes. Is that a good pronunciation? Yes, perfect. What's your Chinese name, Rachel? Long Wei Ju. Okay, but you publish with with Rachel. Uh, Rachel under Long. Rachel Long, yes. Okay. <laughs> What's your job these days, Rachel? I am now professor and uh, head of the Department of Translation at Ningnan University. Oh, you're the head? In Hong Kong. Wow. Well, Good. since last year, Congratulations. And I'm also uh, the associate dean for research and postgraduate studies. Okay. So uh, this is a small university. Uh, I'm supposed to wear multiple hats. Okay. I don't have to teach because of the heavy administration. And I'm struggling with uh, research, reading, and publication, that kind okay. of stuff, just like any other colleagues. But we know you as somebody who's done important work on the history of translation. I published a monograph mm -hmm. on uh, uh, interpreters in early China, yeah. and uh, that was published uh, with John Benjamin, 2011. Um, um, after that, I continued to uh, explore um, subject matters along this line. Yeah. I published uh, something about Silen, um, meaning old Korean interpreters, yes, uh, yes. being very active in uh, uh, Shandong province in China. In you know, which, Shandong, which period? Is that? Um, ninth century. Okay, right. So you're really, really going right back. Uh, in, yeah, in, in history, but then yeah. again, materials is really limited. So there's just that much you could do, but okay. no more. But you're also focusing on interpreters. Yeah. Which means all the information is indirect. Pretty much, yeah. except that I was. Uh, I was uh, taking uh, a monk's, a Japanese monk's uh, diary as the basis mm -hmm. to start with. And that Japanese monk was writing in uh, Chinese, not perfect Chinese, but uh, comprehensible. So uh, that is how I uh, managed that area. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I've just seen you give a talk on a completely different part of translation history, but, but uh, a school that was here in Beijing in the 19th century. Yes, that's Tell right. That. The, how um, historical that we are doing this interview in Beijing. Uh, mm. And the Peking College um, was a product after the Second Opium War. I mean, China was forced to interact uh, with the global mm -hmm. community. And um, back then, China did not have that many bilinguals. So communication was, was a problem. And uh, so somehow, Qing China had no choice yeah. but to, you know, push itself to train uh, bilinguals. That was the background mm. for the formation of the Peking College. So they were training bilinguals um, who used translation, but they weren't no. teaching. It was strange. They're not teaching translation as such. Well, they the most imminent need was someone who could mediate yeah. in diplomatic settings right. and to translate correspondence between countries. Okay. So they really started from the scratch yeah. and I must say that um, uh, the, the competence of the first generation of translators and interpreters uh, was actually quite limited. Mm -hmm. They are okay but not perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. These were Chinese people learning European languages and and they're learning, they're learning from foreign lecturers. Right. And the uh, uh, funny thing was, they, they were, they were learning uh, for a foreign language. They were learning a uh, Western learning mm -hmm. kind of knowledge as well, uh, science, technology, social science, laws, and economics. Okay. International law was a new subject to nineteenth yeah. century yeah, yeah, yeah. China. So. And then they were using translation all the way through, as a as a testing technique, or as yeah, as, uh, um, they they were not learning to translate, yeah. so to speak. The idea was to pick up a foreign language, and at the same time, they are learning different subjects um, along the Western learning uh, oh, line. Okay, and with that, they just you know make do pretty okay. much. Let's go right back when you were in your mid twenties. Mm. Where were you? What when were you I was doing there? Prettier. Everyone was <laughs> just as pretty. <laughs> well, I was a PhD student at SS University, 
uh, in, in the UK, where? SS. Oh, oh yes, okay. Sure. And uh, uh, I was doing uh, social linguistics actually. Um, so not even translation. I well, I study I study translation and interpreting uh, in my uh, uh, sort of undergraduate. Okay. Uh, good. I was doing a high diploma in All that right. regard, and yeah. after that, I w I work in the government as a translator for two years. In Hong Kong. Yeah, before okay. oh, before, before going to, before yes, going yes. to the UK, yeah. and uh, I did a master first, um, and then uh, I was given a chance to be upgraded to a, a PhD yeah. program, so I could finish the PhD uh, degree in three years. Eventually, I managed it in three and a half years. What was the PhD on? Uh, English language and linguistics. So nothing to do with translation or translation history. But then the social linguistics and linguistics background mm. helped me to be a better teacher in uh, translation and interpreting. Oh. Because yeah, sure. Because uh. these are the things students have to yeah. learn. And I managed to have that kind of background to okay. fit into the department. So how did you get from then your, your work in social linguistics, mm -hmm. and language education, to, to where you are now? Is it well, it's all driven by career opportunities, yeah. Professor Pim. Uh, my first job uh, was research assistant professor in the Department of uh, Language and, and Translation. So obviously I was asked to... Uh, in which in university? City University of okay, Hong Kong. Okay, so you moved around in Hong Kong. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah. I was, I was lucky to get my uh, first job very soon after my uh, PhD. Yeah. And uh, I worked there for three years is a perfect opportunity for me to uh, do research and publish. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I did not have to do uh, a lot of teaching. And on that basis, uh, I look around for a further academic job. And uh, uh, I, at some point, I worked in Hong Kong U School of Continuing Education mm -hmm. as a program uh, director okay. uh, to pretty much develop uh, translation and interpreting related programs for lifelong learners. Okay. And I decided that I was not very interested in it. I wanted to do research. So I moved on and looked for jobs in other universities in Hong Kong. So in 2003, I landed with uh, Mingnan Jimmy University. Yeah. Okay. And Is that where you did the, the work on translation history in China? Yes, okay. yes. Okay, so I you found space and time to do some serious research. Actually, Mingnan is a good place yeah. uh, for me to do research and to actually develop an academic career. We have okay. the space and time okay. and resources. To Why it. translation history? I was inspired by uh, a Chinese historian, uh, Li Nan Chiu. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have read uh, his book published in 2001 in Chinese uh, on the history of interpreting in China. And coming from his historical background, he is laying things out chronologically. And uh, I feel that if I were to do history of interpreting, I would not do it this way. Mm -hmm. If I do it this way, it's a historical way, and you're reading history from a historian's viewpoint. Mm -hmm. If I'm interested in the history of interpreting, I should look at it like an interpreter. And I want to uh, speak up for interpreters. That's why I have particular sympathy and compassion for people back in the old days doing the impossible jobs of interpreting. And, okay. and with this mindset, I, I pay attention to minute details, uh, to the uh, ecology of the uh, context in which they work, mm. and the people around, and you know, power hierarchy and, and all that. I think these are important uh, contextual information. If we were to look at interpreters in history from a multi-dimensional angle. What, what about people who say that when we do the history of translation and interpreting, we should do it so as to speak to historians, more general historians, to in a way correct their vision or point out the importance of, of languages? I, well, personally, I don't think it's uh, very much of a concern to me uh, historians doing history uh, is in a way different from uh, translators and, and interpreters doing uh, research of history mm -hmm. of their own profession. 
we, we are coming from different angles and different concerns Okay, so you think it's, it's, it's fine for us to research our own past, if you like? I think so. To explore and, our own identity. And it's only in this way we could give due attention to the profession and the professionals. Okay, mm -hmm. great. What kind of research would you like to see more of? You mean uh, the field as a whole? In translation studies or? Yeah. Well, I... And um, I include interpreting in translation studies, but yes. I, I, well, I, when we started uh, studying the field of translation studies, there were more people working on uh, textual analysis, mm -hmm. uh, text-based kind of translation yes, studies. Yes. But I have a feeling that over the past two decades, people, well, you call it this interdisciplinary uh, and whatnot, people are drifted away from text. Mm -hmm. And or away from linguistic analysis. Exactly. Yes. And uh, I, I would like people to pay more attention on text, translation, translated mm -hmm. text. And it's from the translated works that we could explore uh, more subject matters of importance for translation studies. Okay. I, I don't want people to forget about it. Okay. What about, though, interpreting where we lose the text? A lot of what we have to do with interpreting is indirect because the spoken word disappears. Well, is, um, it, is that not a problem? Um, many people work on history of interpreting. But my suggestion is that do not just tell stories. You have to, you have to have a particular angle of importance to translation studies and interpreting studies, mm -hmm. to make those stories, to connect those stories uh, with an insight. Okay. Uh, I hope that I, I managed to convey what I wanted to say to you. Uh, the thing is, stories are interesting. Yeah. But then we don't just want to hear stories. We want to look at uh, the subject matters broadly and with a wider scope. I think I understand I, I don't want to the importance of text. It's evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can tell any story you like about history, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but texts and the facts of interpreting mm -hmm. anchor us somehow in a, in a more complex reality. That's true, that's true. I, I, you see sometimes when we are in conference, uh, we listen to people uh, talking about their research on history of interpreters, particular interpreter, particular time period. Uh, there's a tendency to, to stay where it is, meaning that they tell a story, they finish telling a story, and that's it. Mm. And then they move on to perhaps another interpreter, another period. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's no um, uh, macro view of the profession yes. of interpreters in the older days. Yes. And I, I think there, there's more we could do and think about how we can do better history of interpreting. I'm still learning about it. I'm, I'm still struggling with it, but uh, with much interest and uh, enthusiasm. Okay. okay, Rachel, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Professor Pim. It's okay. a bit of pressure. <laughs>